Sup y'all, and welcome to Cities and Urban Land Use, Part 7. In this video, we're going to look at this essential question. Which models help explain American urbanization in the latter 20th century? Let's continue our investigation of urban models by doing a quick recap. First of all, looking at the Burgess Concentric Zone model, which was developed in the 1920s off of Chicago. And then, of course, later on with the sector model by Homer Hoyt in 1939 with the advent of the electric trolley. And as time and technology changed, so did the complexity of the cities. So that brings us to the multiple nuclei model, which was developed by Chauncey Harris and Edward Ullman around 1945. Now, they made the argument that neither of the previous two models were accurate, that the CBD was losing its dominant position as the nucleus of the urban area and that several nodes of growth could be seen, which is why when you look at this model, which is not one that you would need to memorize in its shape or form, but you can see more of the disjointed nature of the city. The separate nuclei would become specialized, and they would not be located in any true relation to any distance attribute. Now what made this possible? Not as much as geography, as much as technology. Yes, I love technology, but not as much as you, you see. But I still love technology, always and forever. What I'm talking about is the effect of the car. And obviously this is not just true in the United States, but car dependence has become a very key element of modern cities. As cars became more affordable and more commonplace, the city became more complex. A car is a comfortable place, much more comfortable than let's say an electric trolley or certainly going on a horse and wagon. And this made traveling less of a burden and led to greater commutes. As cities became more complex and transport technology improved and became more affordable, people were able to move further away from the cities where there was greater space and they were closer to amenities like parks or lakes. Now suburbs are residential areas either existing as part of a city or as a separate residential community within commuting distance of a city. Now in some cases, beyond the suburbs, exist exurbs, these extra-urban commuter zones. They're rings of prosperous communities beyond the suburbs that are commuter towns for an urban area. Here's a couple examples you can see in Loudoun County, Virginia, the Woodlands in Texas. These regions are home to many upper-class people. Now, exurbs vary in size, but may be composed of smaller neighborhoods to larger towns or cities. Often the residents are relatively wealthy with higher levels of education than the average suburbanite. One possible example to look at in South Florida will be way out in Weston. So understanding these concepts, we can move on to the peripheral model, or what's sometimes called the galactic city model. Now this was developed by Chauncey Harris, the same one who had done the multiple nuclei model. And in fact, this was an offshoot of the multiple nuclei model. Now as suburbs continue to sprawl, they spawn many suburban nucleations or concentrations. This urban decentralization leads to more downtowns and specialized corridors, and these are often linked by metropolitan expressway systems, sometimes called a beltway. So if we take a look at this map, you can see going around the town, you see this area of expressway. Beltways are organized because of the reality of relative distance. Now, absolute distance would tell you that to go through Atlanta, you'd go through the shortest distance, a straight line. But going through a city in the middle of the day would take you forever. So going around in a beltway takes you less time, and around those areas, other urban concentrations begin to form. The model shows that the periphery is part of a functional metropolitan complex, not just a series of separate CBDs. This is the reality of a post-industrial economy where the bulk of the people are working in tertiary economic activities more than secondary economic activities. And then we come to the urban realms model that was put together by James Vance back in 1964. Now, he noticed that over time, the smaller villages, towns, and suburbs may grow to become more self-sufficient suburban sectors that be focused on their own independent CBDs. Vance was able to look at San Francisco's urban ecology and summarize the economic processes into a model. What formed were these urban realms, these conurbations, these connected urban areas. So for example, he looked at San Francisco and noticed, of course, you have places like Oakland or Berkeley that are very close. Now, he stated that there were four criteria that shaped the extent, character, and the internal structure of each of these urban realms. 
Now, of course, you'd have to look at terrain or the topography, how much water is available in the area, which could obviously adjust the size or shape. Also, look at the size of the metropolis, the central city that would be the core of the entire urban realm. Another one to look at would be the amount of economic activity in each of those realms. Of course, that could change uh, over time and also change the size and shape. And finally, looking at transportation, the internal accessibility, the transportation within each realm and between all realms. Now, sometimes these urban realms can eventually become edge cities in themselves. Now, this was proposed by Joel Garrow back in 1991. To understand what an edge city is, first of all, it has to have extensive office and retail space. In other words, it'd be designed for car travel, not so much designed for residential areas. There would be very little residential space. In other words, the daytime population would be much larger than the nighttime population. These places would be an end destination, not necessarily a place where a lot of people would live. Often, they'd be located near transportation nodes, like beltways or airports. And finally, he said that they would not have been cities around the 1960s. This is a relatively new development. You can see a couple examples, like Miracle Mile in Los Angeles, or a new center in Detroit. And this is just another map to look at, not again to memorize. You can see it shows edge cities of Philadelphia, and actually even across the Delaware River into New Jersey. Now, the development of edge cities took place in three different waves in U.S. history. The first one, beginning with the era of massive suburbanization after World War II, where essentially the main residential areas were beginning to move away from the central cities and out into the suburbs. Then what occurred was what was called the Mauling of America, where as there were enough people living out in the suburbs, they started to bring more markets, more businesses were opening up in those areas in the 1960s and 1970s. And then finally, you hit to the Ed cities themselves. When you started to move more towards tertiary activities, away from more secondary, Ed cities became much more viable. Tertiary jobs can be located in many more places than secondary or certainly primary. And of course, this was taking place in the 1980s and 1990s. And to conclude, there are three different types of Ed cities you should know about. The most common type are the boomers, also known as boombergs or boomburbs. These are the ones that have developed incrementally around a shopping mall or highway interchange, which reflects the galactic city model. Another type are built on what are called greenfields, which describe previously undeveloped land in a city or rural area, either used for agriculture, landscape design, or just love to nature. These ed cities are usually designed from the ground up and are located on the suburban fringe. Greenfields are in contrast to brownfields or gray fields. So, brownfield sites are abandoned or underused industrial and commercial facilities that could be available for reuse. And grayfield sites refer to unused urban structures, such as abandoned strip malls or empty asphalt. These are often considered a cheaper option for investment since they are not likely to be polluted or contaminated, like brownfield sites. And then, finally, there are the uptowns. These are revitalized activity centers built over an older and historic city or town. So, ed cities have resulted in and have been the result of urban sprawl, but they are nonetheless a very real part of our modern urban landscape.